Hola, gracias Oswaldo y gracias por su asistencia. Um, me llamo Matt, I am Matt Recco, I am International Business Manager for Tremco. Um, you will be hearing today from Dante, he is our technical expert for what we call CSW, coating, sealants, and waterproofing. On Wednesday, you will hear from uh, Jim Hansen. He is our technical expert in AlphaGuard. Um, we have several projects to create a better relationship between Tremco and Euclid uh, Latam. So some of those projects, we are doing New Day action items. I speak with Oswaldo and my boss, Sam Apia, who is vice president of um, Tremco International. We are also doing New Day action items with uh, Leonardo Gomez and Sebastian Passi. Uh, another goal we have is to have our website. When you go on and see, see the technical data sheets, the lead sheets, the application instructions, we are working on getting those translated into Spanish to help you. Your success is our success. Our success is your success. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dante to speak about coating, sealants, and waterproofing. My name is Dante. I'm from the US, and that's all the Spanish I know I can say. Uh, my wife speaks Spanish, so she told me to say that before I started the presentation today. So, um, I'll give you a quick little introduction here. My name is Dante Marin Petrie. I'm a senior technical representative from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, we deal with uh, our Tremco line. We deal with our waterproofing. We deal with coatings. We deal with uh, sealants, urethane, and silicone, um, and air barrier products. So, I support all of those products from a technical perspective. Uh, right now, I'm going to get a chance to talk to you about the uh, sealant applications. So the, uh, what we're going to talk about in the portion of this slide here is we're a little agenda. Uh, what is the point of sealants? What do they do? Um, specifications that we see in the sealant world, uh, joint design and sealant application. I'm going to briefly touch on sealant chemistry, uh, the application where we will use some of these sealants, and then some of the resources that are available to you uh, down here in Latin America. The function of sealants, what they do, we basically just want to use it to keep water out. That's the main point protect occupied spaces and structural elements from air and or water intrusion. We use sealants for uh, thermal management. So you can see here in the uh, detail here, air, uh, you have a hot air. I always use the example when I give this presentation. If you have uh, a multifamily residential unit, this side maybe is uh, older people that like to keep it in the, uh, the 80s, uh, which would be Celsius. I'm trying to think of what that is, Celsius probably 30 degrees Celsius, very hot, muy caliente. And then on the other side, uh, you have somebody who wants to keep it a little colder. Uh, so the problem is you have energy loss because you have air infiltration going from one side to the next. Sealants can do that. They can help save you money, protect uh, air infiltration and exfiltration. We use sealants for dynamic moving joints too. We also use sealants for sound dampening. Similar concept to the uh, thermal management, Sealants in between multifamily residential units. You have one side that has uh, people playing the drums. You have the other side where uh, somebody trying to sleep at night. Sound travels through waves. If you stop the waves, you stop some of the sound. That's what we use sealants for. We also use sealants for fire stopping. And then we also use sealants for aesthetic purposes too. Around crown moldings, around uh, door frames, around windows as a uh, uh, beauty seal. In the sealant world, we talk about ASTM C920. That is the sealant specification. It is the most widely used and accepted specification in the world. There are other ones that I'll touch on in a little bit. However, ASTM C920 is the most common. Um, I deal with some of our sales reps from down here in Latin America. I deal with sales reps in the Middle East, in Australia, um, and Europe. And nine times out of ten, the specifications that they're trying to achieve and meet are ASTM specifications. The ASTM C920 specification is a specification that is made up of test methods designed to com provide comparative data between the two uh, sealants. Mm -hmm. It allows you to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Here are some of the different tests that you use to 
classify the different grades or types. There's a test method to determine if a product is single component or multi-component. There's a test method to determine if a sealant's viscosity is non-sag or if it's a uh, pourable sealant. There is a test method to determine the movement class of the sealant. That is ASTM C719. It's called the, uh, the Hockman cycle. H-O-C-K-M-A-N, Hockman cycle. Uh, and the different classes for sealants that you can have are 12.5%, 25%, 35%, 50%, or an extension of 100% and a compression of 50%. So that moves the sealant in and out. There's other test methods that we use to determine if it's a traffic rated sealant or if it's a non-traffic rated sealant, you're basically just measuring the hardness of the sealant. That test method is ASDM C661 and that is, uh, we call that shore A hardness. Uh, we also have different test methods to determine if the sealant is acceptable for use with glass, if it's acceptable for use with masonry, um, aluminum, water immersion. These are all different tests that are a part of ASTM C920, the sealant specification. Some of the other specifications that we see in the sealant world, not nearly as common, but we see them. Uh, we see U.S. federal specifications. Uh, so one of them that I have a jet engine here. One of them is jet engine fuel resistance. The other one um, are Canadian specifications that we have up here, which are very similar to the ASTM C920 specifications. Uh, as I said previously, ASTM C920. ASTM C834 is another sealant specification, but that is specifically for uh, late sealants, latex acrylics, acrylics. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the sealants themselves and the types of joints that they would go into. We classify joints as three types. They are fixed joints, which are non-moving, and I'll get into it a little further. Expansion joints, where we expect to see lots of building movement. And crack control joints, where we expect the crack to form. Fixed joints are where you have metal pieces that metal here is the example, but something where it's mechanically attached and you're just providing a, uh, a water seal. You do not expect to see a lot of movement here. Typically these types of sealants are lower performance. Expansion joints, expansion joints are where you have all of your building movement concentrated. Buildings move. Thermal, manage, thermal expansion and contraction, seismic movement, uh, all these different types of loadings cause joint movement. That's where we try and concentrate the joint movement is the expansion joints. When we install an expansion joint, we want to make sure that we install the sealant in a two to one width to depth ratio. That means that the width is two times the depth, up to a half inch deep. So if we have a one inch joint, we have half of an inch depth of material. If we have a half inch joint, we have a quarter inch depth of material. That's a widely accepted rule of thumb in uh, the sealant world. Once you start getting over that half inch depth, the problem is you have so much sealant in that joint, the joint cannot flex and move, and you'll end up seeing tearing in it. Baccarat or bond breaker tape is a very important part of sealant use. There's three main reasons for the baccarat. The first is it's a bond breaker. If we don't have a bond breaker, something preventing three-sided adhesion, what's going to happen is, I'll go back real quick. If there was something underneath here that the sealant was bonded to, and the sealant was bonded here and here, when you saw movement, you would see tearing. You would see the sealant ripping. Or you could even see the sealant bonding so well to the substrate that you rip the substrate apart. Another good part of the uh, Baccarat, one of the reasons for it, is it controls the depth of the sealant. Uh, I'll pull it out in a second. I brought a tool that I use to demonstrate how to install the backer rod at the appropriate depth. It's got two wheels on each side and then an adjustable wheel in the center. And you adjust that wheel to the depth of the backer rod you want to set. And you run the two wheels on the outside of the joint and that other wheel in the center is, uh, is deeper. So it's however deep you want to set your backer rod. This comes in handy if you're doing something like a uh, precast wall panel where you have an eight inch panel, for example. You don't want to fill that whole joint with sealant you want to make sure that you have your appropriate depth, keeping in mind that two to one width to depth ratio. Uh, as I was saying, it controls depth. Uh, the example with the precast concrete panels, those are anywhere from six to eight inches deep, at least in the typical construction in the United States that I'm used to. Uh, you don't want to fill that with sealant all the way. You use the backer rod tool to set the depth of the backer rod, and then you can install the appropriate amount of sealant. It also supports tooling. 
So you have your backer rod in place at your appropriate depth, and then you want to come in and use your rounded spatula. Uh, some countries use uh, soapy water and a wooden stick. You apply force, and the force pushes the sealant into the nooks and crannies or the pores of the substrate. That is applying the force, like I said, to the sealant. So if you didn't have something back there, you could just push the sealant through the joint. The backer rod holds the sealant in place when you apply the force, and it pushes into the substrate, getting intimate contact. There are two main types of backer rod. There is open cell backer rod and closed cell backer rod. And there is a hybrid type called soft rod. The open cell backer rod is great for certain applications and the closed cell backer rod is great for certain applications. The open cell backer rod you can use in situations where you have a vertical joint running up a wall, where you have a large joint. The, uh, the nice thing about the open cell is it allows air and moisture to get to the backside of the sealant. So you can cure the sealant effectively from both sides. A closed cell backer rod is, um, what's the word I want to use? It's uh, impermeable. It doesn't allow moisture to get to the other side of the joint. So if you have a horizontal joint on grade, you'd want to use a closed cell backer rod. And the closed cell backer rod, like I said, keeps moisture from getting the backside of the sealant. If you have moisture getting to some of the backside, to the backside of some certain types of sealants, you could have some issues. You could have what we call outgassing. And I have a sample here I'd like to pass around just to show you what outgassing looks like. I have two beads of sealant here. One is totally filled, and the other one has these voids and bubbles. That's what we call outgassing. And I'll pass these around real quick. Go ahead and pass them around. If I could just get all these samples back, I'll pass out when we're done. That would be a great help. The outgassing, what it is, it's when moisture comes into contact with some of the sealants, it releases CO2 and creates bubbles which that's not too bad of an example, but I've seen other examples where the bubbles are protruding from the joint and it just looks very unpleasing. Um, so that's one of the benefits of using the closed cell backer rod is you don't get moisture to the backside of that joint. As I said, typically you wanna use the open cell in vertical joints above grade and then the closed cell on horizontal joints on grade. The other type of joint that I'm gonna talk about real quick here are crack or control joints. They're, we refer to them as saw cut joints. Um, I have been looking, but I haven't seen a lot of these down here. But what they are is they, a guy will come in with a tool, um, you can see here, with a trowel when they cast the concrete to create that joint, or they'll come in after the fact with a uh, concrete saw and dig a joint out. That's where we expect the concrete to crack. Typically, there's rebar that's gonna run through that joint. That joint is just going to manage the thermal expansion and contraction. It's not a high performance joint here, but you typically need something that will support traffic. The point is, if you don't treat that joint and you have a crack get down in there, you have a crack develop, I'm sorry, you have moisture get down in that crack, moisture will rust the rebar and the oxidation force of the rebar is greater than the internal strength of the concrete, typically. So what you'll have happen is you'll have concrete spalling, you'll have concrete popping off, and that's a much more expensive fix than installing sealant in the first place and performing typical maintenance on the sealant. Some of the factors that can cause movement um, are thermal expansion and contraction, as we talked about. You guys, I don't think, see it nearly as much as we see it in our northern climates. Um, I think I talked to my wife this morning, and it was 25 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's less than zero Celsius. So, and in the summer, we will get to somewhere in the neighborhood of 28, 29 degrees Celsius, close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So we see a lot of thermal expansion and contraction where I'm from. Here, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems the temperatures are very consistent, um, where you're mostly in the 17 to 25 degree range Celsius, correct? So thermal expansion and contraction down here is not as big of an issue as it is in a climate like where I'm from. Um, another, air, another thing that can cause movement, another factor that can cause movement is new loads. So if you build a manufacturing facility, you caulk all the joints and then they come in and they put the manufacturing equipment, heavy loads, tow motors coming over these joints, different loadings, deflection and settling. The example here that I like to show this tow motor, the, uh, the ground settled under the joint. The tow motor goes over it and then you see this shear. Some sealants can accommodate that and some can't. This picture is much more applicable from where I'm from in Cleveland, Ohio. 
When we install sealants, we want to try and install them at the median temperature of the environment. That doesn't always happen, but that's our typical recommendation. So using this for an example, and I'm sorry this was a picture, I couldn't change this to Celsius, but this is in the neighborhood of 15, 12 degrees Celsius. That would be the median temperature of where I'm from, um, which is the middle, which would be like three days of the year. The rest of the year is five degrees, uh, which is close to your, it's less than your zero, that would be negative 10 almost, to 90, which is closer to 30 Celsius. So we, like I said, we want to try and install the sealants at the nominal joint width at the median temperature. But we understand that it's not always feasible uh, when installing projects. One of the things I recommend you do is if you have a large temperature swing, if you're going to install in the winter when it's colder, install in the warmest part of the day. If you're installing in the summer where it's very warm typically, install in the afternoon when the substrate is cooling down. Uh, that's one of the ways we combat the excessive movement. Otherwise, if you don't, and you install your sealant at this largest joint width, your sealant is then in compression the rest of its life. If you install the sealant at the warmest temperature, the sealant is then in extension the rest of its life. So for what that means is if it's in compression, you develop what we call a bread loafing where it sticks above the joint and it wears a lot faster. If it's in extension, the sealant is seeing a lot of stress on that bond line and it's pulling. Some of this stuff may be uh, a little under everybody's head, a little low on the radar, but I just wanted to make sure that we talk about some of the basics of installing sealants first. When prepping a joint, you want to make sure that you remove any dust or debris or oils. The big thing is you want to make sure that you don't have anything there that could impede the bond of the sealant. After you do that, you would then install your backer rod and or primer if necessary. We would typically recommend you do a mock-up to make sure that your sealant and sealant primer combination are acceptable for your substrate. Uh, we have large lists of common construction substrates, but we always recommend a mock-up just to make sure because we never know if something was on that substrate prior to us getting a chance to bond to it. Our sealants come in typically three different types of packaging. We have what we call the sausage, we have a cartridge, and we have bulk. When installing the cartridge, material out of a cartridge, you want to make sure to trim the nozzle to the diameter um, that is slightly less than the joint. And then if there's foil, puncture that. Insert the cartridge into the gun, squeeze the trigger until a steady stream of sealant flows. I know a lot about our products, but sometimes I'm not the artist that I claim to be when it comes to installing the material. The, uh, it should be a much more steady stream of sealant when you're installing it. If you're installing material out of a sausage, you want to trim the metal clasp off the end of it, drop the sausage into the gun, screw the nozzle onto the gun, and cut the nozzle to the diameter, the, I'm sorry, cut the nozzle to the desired bead diameter, which is slightly less than the joint width. And then you want to squeeze the trigger until you have a steady stream of sealant. If you have bulk material coming in a one and a half, three, or five gallon pail, what you want to do is you want to open the pail before you add anything to it, you want to mix it up just to make sure that nothing settled out in it. Then what you want to do is take your color pack or curative, if you have a curative catalyst, add that in while the mixing paddle is going. Typically this takes two people to uh, prep a pail. The paddle that we like to use is a straight blade uh, paddle. We call it a, a jiffy blade. Uh, I have some pictures of that. I can show you guys later. I did not bring one with me. It wouldn't. TSA would not allow me to carry that on. Then what you want to do is you want to take your mixing paddle, work it up and down in the pail, and around the pail. By the time you're done, the pail should be totally dented. The recommendation is to mix it between five and six minutes. You w the big thing you want to look for is that there's no striations in the material. You want to see that the color pack is evenly mixed in. Uh, sealant installation in bulk, then you still want to take the gun. You've got to fill it somehow, right? You take the gun and then you soak it, you dump, dunk it in the material, and then you grab the, uh, the plunger and pull up. You want to make sure that when you flip the gun back up, you don't throw the sealant everywhere, so you have to be careful with that. 
and then you use a solvent rag to wipe off the threads, install your, uh, your ring with the nozzle, and then have your nozzle cut to the desired bead diameter. So we're all ready to go. We've installed the sealant. One of the most important parts is we have to make sure to tool the sealant. We want to make sure we call it wetting out of the sealant. The sealant is bonded to the or in the pores of the substrate. So that way you can develop a good mechanical bond. Filling of the joint takes lots and lots and lots of practice to get the right amount of material in the joint the first time, as opposed to having to come back and add material or take material out. When installing the material, you want to leave no air pockets within the sealant. You want to make sure that that is a solid rubber mass. You want to make sure that it's 100% filled, and then you tool it and apply the force from the tool to the, uh, to the bead of sealant, wetting it out into the substrate. You want to typically tool it to an hourglass shape. There are other configurations, depending upon your situation, um, that you would use, but typically it's an hourglass shape. Now we're going to briefly jump into the different sealant types. We have polyurethanes, we have silicones, we have hybrid sealants, we have multi-component sealants, we have single component sealants, we have gun grade sealants, we have self-leveling sealants. It's very easy to get confused with all this. I'm going to talk about the three main, main, there are other chemistries, but the three main sealant chemistries. The first that you guys use quite a bit, um, to my knowledge, is the urethane sealant. That is composed of a polyol and an isocyanate. What happens is you have both of these molecules in the same tube. If you have our Dimonic 100, our Vulcan 45 SSL, they're in the same tube. You then have a blocking group that sits on the end of the polymer and interacts with the atmospheric moisture. That atmospheric moisture reacts with the blocking group and vacates it from the system, freeing up the active point for the polyol and the isocyanate to bond to each other. Here's just a simple example of what happens. This bonds with this to make the urethane polymer. It's that simple. Typically, you're going to want to use a urethane sealant when you need something that will accept traffic, something that people can drive on, walk on. They're typically a little harder. And again, I'm saying typically. Uh, there are exceptions to all of these rules. Typically, urethane sealants are paintable. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our Dimonic 100. It's paintable. You can use it underneath all of our coatings, all of our membranes, um, all of our systems. It is typically urethanes are non-staining too. Also, they can handle immersed conditions. The other sealant chemistries cannot handle that. And out of all of the other sealant chemistries, the urethanes are typically the lowest cost. The other uh, major sil sealant chemistry is silicones. We use silicones a lot of times for glazing applications and things of that nature. And I'm just going to touch on them here. Silicone polymers, unlike urethanes, are made of the inorganic element silicon, which makes them much more stable. They have larger orbitals in the, uh, they're farther down on the periodic table, so they're bigger and heavier, which means they're much more stable. The, uh, the amount of silicone elements in the polymer determines the amount of oxygen elements in the polymer, which then determines the final physical properties, making it more dense, less dense. Um, some of the silicones for glazing structural glazing applications, they have lots of silicon and they have lots of oxygen and they're very tightly bound. Some of the silicones that handle a lot of movement do not have that tightly bound structure and they're a lot softer. Here is my favorite <laughs> One of my favorite slides. I, am a, I, I have a chemistry degree, so it's kind of, I think it's funny. Why is, is silicone chemistry big in Spain? C. Uh, there are multiple different types of silicone sealants. There are multi-components, which is where you have a part A mixing with a part B. Um, those are typically done through pumps or uh, uh, a static mixing nozzle for types of guns. The single component cures, the single component silicones, are defined by the byproduct of their cure. An alcohol or a neutral cure silicone releases alcohol, OH functional group. An anionic, which is an amine cure, releases a basic material like a nitrogen um, element. A cationic uh, or acetoxy cure uh, releases an acidic material. If you ever caulk uh, your bathtub, 
the stuff that you would buy from the store, uh, you would smell like a vinegar smell. That vinegar smell is the blocking group that is sitting on the end of the polymer that reacts with the atmospheric moisture, and that's an acetoxy cured silicone. Typically with silicones, they have the longest life expectancy because they are the most stable. They don't have any surface cracking. They have great color stability because they're so stable. They have a larger temperature range where you can, you can have them for their service life at negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And there are other silicone types of chemistries that have a larger range, but this is just generally speaking. You have tenacious adhesion with silicone products to non-porous substrates, metals, glass, uh, kynar finishes, um, different coatings like that. You can use silicones for structural glazing applications. And you have many different chemistries to choose from. And those chemistries define the cost. So some you have cheaper and some you have more expensive. Next chemistry that I'm going to briefly talk about is what we call spur technology, or hybrid technology. There's two different types of hybrid technologies. There is spur, which is a silyl terminated polyurethane chemistry. And then there's an MS polymer. <coughs> For reference, I have the urethane chemistry down here. We have a polyol that reacts with an isocyanate that creates the urethane polymer. The MS polymer has a polyether as opposed to a polyol reacting with silanes. The spur technology has a polyol that reacts with an isocyanate, and on the end of that isocyanate is a silane molecule. Some of the features and benefits of this is they're typically cheaper than silicones more expensive than urethanes, typically. The, uh, they are the lower VOC end of the products. You have better UV resistance than most urethanes, but not quite as good as the silicones. You have low dirt pickup. Dirt does not stick to it. Uh, you have good adhesion to most common construction substrates. Uh, you can adhere to glass. You can adhere to concrete. It's, it's very versatile. And as I said on the cost spectrum, you're in the middle. You're not at the higher end of the silicone or the lower pro cost end of the urethane. So now that you are all expert chemists, I'm going to jump into the actual Tremco products that we have. Diamonic 100 is newer urethane technology. Um, just by a show of hands here, do any of you guys have experience working with uh, Tremproof 250GC or Vulcan 45 SSL? If you do, feel, raise your hand. So we have two people, three, okay. The uh, Diamonic 100 is the same base polymer, but it has a couple different features to it that make it a gun grade sealant as the Vulcan 45 SSL and the Tremproof 250 GC. But the base polymer is the same, and I'm going to dive into that one in a little bit. Vulcan 116 is uh, a single component urethane. Uh, this has a texture to it, and I'll actually pass out a couple samples of this here. Let me pass out a couple here. And then, as I said with the other ones, if I could get these back at the end, that would be fantastic. I'm going to give one over here. You can see the texture of the sealant. Uh, the other sealants don't necessarily have that texture. Uh, that's a features benefit thing for um, this product. It's uh, uh, been around for longer than I've been alive, I think. Uh, it's been around for quite a while. Uh, and we have a lot of proven success with it. Uh, it's paintable in most applications. Obviously, it depends upon the paint that is coming over it, but it is typically paintable. Uh, it's a real go-getter sealant that we would use. The Daimonic FC is a hybrid sealant. I'm going to pass out some of those samples, too. We typically loop the Daimonic FC in with the urethane technology just because the base polymer is a urethane. And as I said, the Daimonic FC, low VOCs for urethanes comparatively. It's hybrid. Um, it doesn't stink like some of the urethanes do. Um, and it also is much more UV resistant than like the Vulcan 116. This is a whole slide dedicated to the Daimonic 100 technology. It's a one part, smooth, gun grade sealant. And I'm going to pass that out again. Here you go. Here you go. Yes, as I said, the Daimonic 100 is a one part smooth polyurethane sealant. It's based off of the same technology as our Vulcan 45 SSL and our Tremproof 250 GC that have been around for 10 to 15 years, depending upon the product. 
it's a globally compliant formula. In the United States, we have the EPA, um, and they mandate that certain chemicals can and cannot be in our products. So what we did was we took a look at the pipe as to what was coming down as what was going to get banned in the sealants. Um, xylenes way out in the long-term future, but things like that, different chemicals. We took look that into account when we formulated the Dimonic 100 sealant, and we don't have any of those hazardous chemicals in it. So therefore, we don't have any changes that are going to come down the pipeline to that sealant to make sure that we meet EPA requirements. One of the benefits of Dimonic 100 is you can use it on green and damp concrete. That's a real big features benefit for you as a contractor. After they pull the concrete forms, 24 hours after that, you can come in and you can start caulking. That accelerates the construction schedule time greatly. You don't have to wait the 14 to 28 days for the substrate, the concrete to cure. From the weather channel I've been watching, it seems like it rains here in Columbia every day at about 3 in the afternoon. Is that correct? So the other thing is, after you get the standing water out of the joint and the substrate is still moist, you can come in and caulk. You don't have to wait until the substrate is completely 100% dry. It adheres to green, the new concrete, and damp concrete, which would be wet. When I say damp, I mean that there's no standing water. We're not going to want to caulk underwater. We just don't mind if it's moist. Primerless adhesion to most common construction substrates, such as concrete. Um, such as wood. Uh, we even get great adhesion to non-porous materials like anodized aluminum, uh, PVC. It's a great all-round sealant for your toolbox. The other cool thing about this is the polymer is much more stable than that of the 116. So it won't yellow and it won't outgas. The way that we buy the polymer is we buy it after the, after the first reaction. It's formulated that first reaction is what causes the outgassing producing the CO2. We get it in-house when we make the Dimonic 100 after that reaction. So therefore, you will not see any outgassing in the field. It's also, like I said, much more UV stable because you don't have to go through that primary reaction in the field to get to the secondary reaction. The movement capability of the sealant is plus 100 minus 50%. We can extend a joint that's one inch out to two inches and compress it down to half an inch which is quite a bit of movement, comparatively to most other urethane sealants. You can use the Dimonic 100 in immersed conditions or even traffic rated conditions. You can see it feels a little harder than uh, some other sealants in the samples that you have. At, in the US, we do offer a 10 year warranty on it, but the warranties down here service through Toximant, so I'm not sure what their warranty policy is on that. One of the real benefits of this is using it with our coatings and waterproofing systems. It skins over real fast almost as fast, if not faster, than some of the two-part sealants. So what you can do is you can come in and you can caulk a joint first thing in the morning. You'll have a skin developed on the top of the sealant. Around lunchtime, you can come in and install your coating or install your membrane over top of it. It's a great detail sealant. Next, I'm going to briefly talk about the silicone sealants that we, the silicone sealants that we have in the Tremco product line. Spectrum 1 is our super high-performance silicone sealant. It has the lowest modulus. It also exhibits a physical property that we call knotty tear, which I will kind of demonstrate. I just don't have three hands is my problem. The cool part about using our Spectrum 1 is if you poke a hole in it, I don't have a knife on me, but if you poke a hole in it, I can show you guys after the fact or at the break if you want to come up here and see it, that hole will not propagate. If you use some of our other silicones or if you even use... Um, competitor silicones and you puncture a hole, that silicone sealant hole, that sealant, sorry, excuse me, the hole in the silicone sealant will propagate and that will unzipper down the joint. The benefit of not having that joint unzipper is you only have to replace a smaller section of the joint, six inches on both sides of that penetration, that tear. Uh, it's quite a unique feature comparatively to other silicone technology. I don't know if you guys have the Proglaze ETA, but that is a silico extruded silicone sheet that we use for window applications, tying the window into your air barrier or your facade. Uh, you would use the Spectrum 1 there. Spectrum 2 is a medium modulus sealant. It's high performance. You can use it for some structural glazing applications. Spectrum 3 is low modulus, not as low as Spectrum 1. And I'm sorry if I didn't define modulus. Modulus means the internal strength of the sealant. 
which means how much force it takes to stretch that sealant. So low modulus typically means high moving sealant. Medium modulus takes a lot of force, does not move as much. So spectrum three is also a low modulus sealant, but not as low as the spectrum one. It is a textured finish, not as pronounced as the Vulcan 116, but it does have a texture to it. When you'd want to use the uh, Spectrum 3 would be if you have granite, if you have marble. It does not stain like some of the other silicone sealants out there. Um, we call it the halo effect, which happens around a joint. Uh, when you have marble or granite, you have your joint that runs through. If your joint ran through the slide here, you'd have a hazy ring around it and we call that like I said the halo effect the spectrum 3 does not do that you'd want to use spectrum 3 for uh, those fancy types of stones we have different multi-component sealants we have our dimeric 240 FC THC 901 Vulcan 45 SS 445 SSL and spectrum 4 dimeric 240 FC is our two-part gun grade polyurethane sealant it's very light and I don't want to say fluffy, but it's almost fluffy. It mixes very easy compared to some of the other uh, two-part sealants out there. Solvent-free, low odor. You can't smell it uh, when you're installing it. Not like it's a real big feature here, but in some of the other markets that you guys may be from where it's colder, uh, it mixes very well in colder temperatures. You have a higher viscosity. It's heavy. It's hard to mix. And if it's cold, the problem would then be it's hard to mix up the pail. The Dimeric 240FC doesn't have that problem because it's so much lighter than the other uh, part urethanes. You can use it for immersed conditions also. Spectrum 4 is our field tintable silicone sealant. This is a neutral cure sealant. It's actually the same as Spectrum 3. The only difference is you would now be able to add a color pack to it. And the color pack is a little pouch about yay big that you pour into the material when you mix it. And that color pack would also go into the Dimeric 240FC. The benefit of having the color pack is you don't need to have a... Spectrum 3, for example, comes in about 20 standard colors. If you have a stamped brick um, area or a special color, you don't have to order a massive minimum quantity. You can use Spectrum 4 or the Dimeric 240FC with that color pack to give you 70 different color options and I hope one of those is probably close enough to your application. Self-leveling polyurethanes, we have the Vulcan 45 SSL and the Vulcan 445 SSL. The Vulcan 45 SSL is the same base product as the Vulcan 445 SSL. The only difference is in the Vulcan 45 SSL, there is color in it. There's six standard colors. In the Vulcan 445 SSL, it comes in a pail as a neutral base. There is no color. You would take one of those 70 standard color packs and mix it in there. The Vulcan 45 SSL or 445 is that newer technology that I talked about. It's based off of the same technology that the Dimonic 100 used and the Tremproof 250 GC uses. It doesn't outgas because of this, the way that we install the polymer in the sealant. It is a semi-self-leveling sealant. You can handle up to a 6% slope. And what you can do with the 45 and the 445 is you can water catalyze it too. I've seen people do this a lot of times where they have uh, an airport or a stadium. They, they're not going to postpone the game so you could come in and install sealant. What you would do is you would mix about you would mix one ounce of water. I'm trying to think of the metric conversion for an ounce uh, in milliliters. Does anybody know that offhand? Okay, mix the metric equivalent of uh, one ounce uh, of water to in uh, a one and a half gallon pail. And at about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 23 degrees Celsius, and 50% relative humidity, that joint will be cured in four to six hours, as opposed to having to wait the next day or two days. Here's the, uh, the same information for the Vulcan 45 and the 445. Um, here's an example of the color packs. This is just a small section of it. There's a whole other two pages with different colors that you can use to install. We also have our single component acrylic latex sealant, which is Tremplex 834, which 
meets and exceeds the specification requirements of ASTM C834. It is a fast skinning sealant and you would typically use this as a detail sealant. We call it a painter's caulk um, on the inside seal of windows uh, around crown molding. The movement capability of the sealant is only 12 and half percent though. So we went over a lot here. One of the things that, as I said, I'm in our tech service department. I get calls all the time from customers asking, what sealant should I use here? Or somebody says, please look at my detail. And I look at the detail and say, that's not the best sealant for your situation. All of these different things run through my mind as a Tremco tech service rep when I'm asked this question. Does your project specification require something specific? Is it, does it require a two-part sealant? Does it require a one-part sealant? These are all questions that you should be asking or if you're a contractor or a sales rep um, or an engineer, what's the best sealant for your application? What is the application? Is it a vertical joint where you could use silicone? Is it going to be painted where you can't use silicone? Um, those are all things that should come into your mind. The substrate type, is it porous? Is it non-porous? Um, as I said earlier in the presentation, typically the silicone sealants do much better in a non-porous situation and the urethane sealants do typically do better in a porous situation. What kind of joint movement is expected in your application? Do you anticipate to see 100% joint movement? If you install our Tremflex 834, you're going to have problems because the movement class of that sealant is only 12.5%. Does the contractor, the installer, have a preference as to what they like to use? Do they like to use silicone? Do they like to use urethane? Do they like to use hybrid technology? That can weigh into it too. Um, is it an experienced caulker? If you have somebody that's been mixing pails up for the last 20 years of their lives, it's not a big deal for them to use a two-part. If you have somebody who doesn't specialize in caulking and waterproofing, you may want to steer them towards a one-part sealant. Is priming required in your situation? If priming is required, we would recommend you do a uh, mock-up to figure out if priming is required, sorry. Um, and that would be something that you want to take into consideration too. Uh, at Tremco, what we do is we have a historical testing database. So customers from all over the world send us in samples of their substrate. And then we will verify the adhesion of our sealants to the substrate and write a nice little fancy report and uh, say whether it passed or failed, um, if primer was required or not. Typically, I have that at my disposal, so I will look in that directory to figure out if we have historical experience with a certain substrate. Uh, I would advise you guys probably want to keep your own, uh, being installers or being uh, engineers or architects, but that is uh, something that I keep in the back of my mind. That tells me if I need primer, if I, need, uh, if I don't need primer, all that kind of stuff. Will the sealant be painted, as I talked about earlier? We don't want to use a silicone if the sealant's going to be painted. Will the sealant be immersed? We don't want to use a silicone sealant. Sealant is going to be used in an immersed application. These are all just different things that have to run through your mind. Some quick general information about cured sealants. Nearly all cured sealants will adhere to themselves. So that means if you're caulking a large concrete deck, you have to stop for the evening, go home, um, have dinner, come back the next morning. You would just solvent wipe the end of the sealant where you left off and then start again fresh the next morning, typically. Many silicones can adhere to polyurethane sealants. So our Spectrum 1 will adhere to our Dimonic 100. It doesn't work the other way. The Dimonic 100 does not adhere to the silicone. And that works for most paints and coatings too. If you have an acrylic coating, a urethane coating, um, they do not adhere to silicones very well. Uh, silicone coatings sometimes adhere to the silicone sealants though. As I said earlier, generally, if you're connecting to an existing sealant, the uh, sealant would need to be solvent wiped prior to the installation. And then, as I said about our testing database that we have in our corporate office, um, I can access it from here if we want. But uh, feel free to reach out to your Tremco rep, your uh, Toximet rep, and they can get with us and we can figure out if we have historical experience bonding to that substrate. With that being said, uh, I think this took a little faster than I thought, but here, feel free to take down my contact information. Um, and you're more than welcome to shoot me an email um, or give me a call if you have any questions or concerns.